Good evening. Um, good evening. How are you? All right. I want to thank you very much for inviting me to be with you to share concepts and ideas. I don't know if is uh, is the voice trans can you hear me in the back at all? Needs, it needs to be louder. Well, they're working on that. All right, let's see how is that better. Okay, uh, how's that? Is that better? Okay. What I want to do today is uh, I want to share some concepts and ideas with you. And so I want you to take this piece of paper that says that's going to give a lot of feedback or no? Okay. Um, the um, Leave this one on too. Okay, all right. Take the philosophical aspects of cultural difference. Okay, this is going to be our worksheet for tonight. In the United States, we have people that are from different ethnic groups. That's the first column. People from the different ethnic groups come from Europe, Africa, Asia, and the Native American. The concept of worldview means people who had a single historical event that changed everything for them. They were forced to speak a different language and forced to convert to a different religion. Hispanics comprise a collective of people who share a common world view. They were subjected to colonial Spain, they were forced to speak Spanish, and forced to convert to Catholicism. To be Hispanic is not race specific. You can be white, Hispanic, black, Hispanic, Native American, Hispanic. You can be Jose Wong and still be what? Yes. All right. Now, <clears throat> the other part of this is to be Hispanic is not contingent upon nationality. You can be Hispanic and come from Argentina or from Chile or from Nicaragua or Cuba or Texas or New York. But if your history says you were subject to colonial Spain, forced to speak Spanish, forced to convert to Catholicism, then you are by that definition sharing a common worldview and you are Hispanic. Now Hispanic is also a political designation and you need to be clear on that too. You see everything has an overt statement and a covert agenda. And in order to survive, you have to listen to the covert statement, but be very clear that there is a covert agenda. See, there's the overt statement, you're on top, that's what's said. But what is actually being done is the covert agenda to be carried out. So while you say, well, we want to know who these people are, you have to ask yourself, why do they want to know? They didn't want to know before. If you were Mexican-American, you were classified as white by the Treaty of Guadalupe, okay? But you weren't treated as white. But in Texas, when it got to be one-third black people voting, one-third white voting, then the Mexican-American vote was very important because it could shift the balance. So you need to know how many there were, where they were, how much money they made, and welcome to the Republican Party. Okay? So what I'm saying with you, it is a device by which we know the economic status and we know the political status of a group of people that are classified with this nomenclature. Now the next three columns are classical philosophical disciplines. The first one is axiology. Please say it. Axiology is the study of values. Values. Axiology is the study of what? Values. Good. The next subject is epistemology. Say it. Epistemology. That epistemology asks the question, 
How do you know knowledge? How do you know knowledge? How do you know things? That's epistemology. Logic asks the question, how do you reason? Now, since you read the materials that I'm a psychologist, the question is, why don't I talk about the psychological aspects of cultural difference rather than the philosophical? So you want to be clear on that. When we use our own disciplines, our focus is too narrow. So what we want to do is we want to expand, and the mother science is philosophy. Now, if I just use my discipline, psychology, I'm a psychologist. I'm a clinical psychologist. I'm a psychoanalyst with advanced training at Zurich, Switzerland. So you see, my vision of the world is very narrowly focused. Now, of course, since I'm the analyst, what does that make all of you? It makes you all patients, doesn't it? You're sick, you need treatment, therapy. Yes, okay. I see that's too narrowly focused. Now let's try it differently. Let's see what happens if someone is an accountant, auditor, tax auditor for the IRS. What does that make all of you? Four. <laughs> okay. Now, you see that those visions are too narrowly focused because that's how you get isms and that's how you get um, I am the good and you're the aberration from. I'm the correct, you're the wrong, I'm the good, you're the bad. Those are stereotypes. And that's how it's done when we're too narrowly focused with our own discipline. Now, what I want to do is I want to use the mother science. So now let's take a, what, what does mother science force us to do? It forces us to examine essences and how does that work? Well, I have a silly game that I've devised, and if you play that, then it will be very clear. It has three steps. Step one, you're to close your eyes. Step two, I ask you to envision a specific noun. And step three, I ask you to open your eyes, and we, then we discuss it. All right, step one, close your eyes. Now, if your eyes are open, you're paranoid. Okay? Step two, envision a chair. A chair. Perhaps even your favorite chair. Step three, open your eyes. Now. If we had taken a Polaroid snapshot of what each person had seen, all of them would be what? Yet if we collected all of them and gave them to any person in the room, each of you would be able to identify each of the pictures as a what? How is that possible? Because you have understood the essence of chairness and you would never confuse it with a what? Table. You see? So what I'm getting at is what are those very essential factors for difference? And I'm using the mother science philosophy to try to ascertain them. My belief system says that for Europeans, the highest value for them is in subject, object, member, object. So the important factor then is the external, the object. That's the highest value. Now, when you make a statement like that, you need some data to back it up. So let's look for some epidemiographic data that corroborates that construct. If a person says that their highest value is in the object, then you can understand what happened in 1929 when there was a crash. Many people lost everything, but significant numbers of white males did what? Yes, because they had lost that which for them was the object of highest value. What happened in 1970, there was an automotive industry that said, if you have worked for us for 30 years or more, effective the 1st of July, you retire. These were 50-year-old men, and for the first time in their lives, they would be without a job. But they had homes paid for, cars paid for, retirement benefits, health benefits, union benefits, everything you would imagine. But after the 1st of July, they would not have a job. So within six months after they were uh, in forced retirement, significant numbers of white males simply began to die. We didn't understand why they were dying. I was working with the National Institute at that time, and our boss came in and said, do something. We said, yes, of course. Now, what did we do? Well, we, of course, began to study. We formed a commission, and we studied the issue. What did we come up with? 
The findings were that these men did not use their creative, t their leisure time creatively. So how are you going to resolve that? Well, what we said was go to the community mental health, go to the community centers and learn how to do something creative. Now these are 50 year old men working with a ball of clay in the community mental health, in the community center. It didn't work, didn't it? Some of them went to your mother's kitchens with the idea of helping to get the wretched place in order, bring it into clarity and order. Well, it didn't work either. Some were mysteriously found murdered because they were meddling in the kitchen too long. So we don't know what happened to them. But others simply went out and got another one. Did that job pay as much money or more? It was just the object. Now, is object only materialism? The answer is no. Power, control, and authority are objects. Now, does it make sense to you in terms of why there's the brutality with police? Because they want to make sure that they maintain the what in any kind of, that's it, in a situation with you. They want the power. That for them is the object. Okay? Now let's go to the next one. For us as blacks, for those that are Hispanic, those that are Arabs, the highest value lies in the relationship between people. So if the highest value is between people in the relationship, it says people in this culture see themselves to each other to be what? Equal. If we are equal and you do something to treat me as less than equal, you have treated me with what? Yes. And what do we call that in black English? There you got it. But what happens to people who diss? Yes, they do. Do you see? See what's going on? Highest value is in the relationship. If you do something to treat me as less than equal, you've destroyed the relationship because you have disrespected me. Now let's go back to our European counterpart where the highest value is in the object. If the highest value is in the object and I have all of the objects, and you cannot physically take one from me, but you need it to survive the winter, how must you act toward me to have access to this resource? You must be what to me? No. Subservient, subordinate, so we develop a hierarchy. You see the hierarchy that has to develop? You are subordinate, subordinate to me, someone is subordinate to you, and so forth, you have a hierarchy. Now, let's see what the difference is between the two. If you have a hierarchy, because I have the object, then I can control your behavior and you. If I want something done, if we were in Germany, and I needed another marker or another piece of paper up here, I would say, now, we have Hans and Fritz right here. Hans and Fritz. Hans outranks Fritz, I outrank Hans. I would say to Hans, Hans, schau! Hans, get up, give me a piece of chalk. Hans would jump up and go get it, wouldn't he? If he had enough time, he would yell to Fritz, Fritz, hast du nicht gehört, was Nichols gesagt hat? Didn't you what Nichols said? And Fritz would go bounding out of here. Now let's see what happens when you're in a situation where people see themselves to be what? All right, now let's see the young black brother right here. What's your name? Aaron. Aaron. Aaron is black, I am black, we see ourselves to be what to each other? Even though I outrank him, he expects me to treat him as what? I know, let's see what happens if I act with Aaron the same way I did with Hans. Aaron, get up off your black woman. No, wait a minute, man, I don't play that. You see? Because the perception is I was not treating him as equal, I was treating him with what? Yes, and could destroy the relationship. Are you beginning to see now how important it is to understand what the axiologies are? Put this in the context of your job. How people treat you at work. So they say, uh, in, in white culture, you tell people what to do. In black culture, you have to what? See how easily and spontaneous it comes? See? Because if we are equal, you ask. If we are in rank order, then you tell. Now, I share these things with you because 
working as a black man with white people umpteen years, I've had my feelings very, my jaw has been very tight on many occasions. In spite of the fact that I intellectually knew this, I still felt differently. You see? Because when people start yelling and hollering at me, I just get an attitude. That's what they say. It's not an attitude. It is that they are attacking my axiology. You know better than I am. Who do you think you are? I have a PhD, you got one too. So what? Even if I didn't have one, it doesn't matter. You treat me as a person. But of course, in the other culture, it is rank order. Whoever rank has what in European culture? Power and privilege. That's the way it is. And so what I'm sharing with you is that these are devices to help you to be more comfortable in the working environment and to understand what is operating. Also, if the highest value is in the relationship, we work constantly throughout the day to establish the relationship. How do we do it? Good morning, hello, how are you? I came up here, I got a big hug, okay? We are constantly working to maintain the relationship. Now, if you're working in an office and you walk by somebody's office,